here this afternoon. So I, I just thought I'd make a couple of comments about uh, things uh, in general. I'll, I'll be here tomorrow. Just, uh, main talk is going to be about uh, you know when there's emergent stuff present. And I'll get to that in a second. Uh, but uh, just, just maybe just to rehearse a little bit of uh, maybe just to situate a little bit about what I'll talk about and I think what what, what we've been doing this morning, but we haven't maybe always said it. Uh, this is an old thing that Josh and I wrote many, many years ago. We talked about the fact that uh, when we build ABMs, it, at least when we think about micro, macro levels to them, we almost always are dealing with uh, uh, estimation, calibration, validation somehow at this macro level. At least certainly when we wrote this paper, we didn't have micro data. We didn't have data on the, on the individuals to do anything with. So uh, if you want to make things quantitative and, and uh, now, the first step of being quantitative, I've written level two here, what we call level two, is kind of macro quantitative, and that's where all the data lived. So, like, Ivan talked about the, the Anastasi model. In the Anastasi model, we had data about, uh, about yes, where the households were, <coughs> about the, the, the physical places, but we didn't really, we had only very qualitative data about how many people were alive. I mean, that, that was from estimates from a, a demographer who, you know, who, who didn't uh, have, you know, there was not much, uh, I mean, from the size of the trash bin, they would, uh, for a core of a trash bin, they would try, try to figure out how many people were alive at a certain time. So, but, but um, I guess what I, what I want to just suggest here quickly, uh, as I move on, is that, uh, uh, you know, what, we're entering a world, though, where level three is not possible. That is, we're entering a world, as I said yesterday, where there are data on every individual in the system available. And I just, well, maybe just if, maybe, maybe think about it, we can talk about it later, but um, I'm not really aware of any models, really, I mean, any models where we, where we, where we do level three. Yes, I mean, the epidemiology models are a model of who, who got sick, and there may be data on individual people, but we don't typically, we're not typically modeling, even though we, we may say we're going to model a million agents, we're not typically modeling, uh, you know, Mr. Smith on the corner and Mr. Jones down here, or, or even in my, when I do six million firms, I don't say here's Exxon and here's Ford. Right? I don't, uh, so I think that the, the thing that's, that's I mean, as a practical matter, I think, when it comes to looking at rule spaces and parameter spaces, I mean, one, you know, one good thing is we don't, we don't have to go to level three. We can basically say we're going to, well, now, what are the behavioral rules, behavioral parameters, microscopic parameter, microscopic specifications, which produce an aggregate outcome? I mean, that, that's really where, all, where almost all the work is, right? I mean, does anybody want to, does anybody think that's right, that's wrong? I mean, uh, so, now, I guess, I, so, the, the, so I've written data rich social science. Historically, we've, we've almost had... Uh, historically, we only had only had aggregate data, but what's coming around today now is microdata. Um, it seems to me that it's a very, very hard problem, though, to uh, to you know, to to search the wide sets of parameter spaces to get the microdata right. In essence, you know, and I, I mean, to first approximation, but today it's not. A, I mean, it was mentioned earlier that uh, a complaint about ABM is that there may be many different rule sets which produce uh, the same kind of let's say aggregate outcome. It wasn't said that way, but I will say it now. And then uh, Mata talked about the difficulty of searching the space of all Turing machines, obviously impossible. Uh, but, but uh, you know, in, in essence, what, we're, what we have these days is, you know, we have, uh, we have no models which explain the data. I mean, when you have data on every individual in the, in the, in the, in the microscopic, in, in, in the social, you're modeling a social process. If you have data on every individual, we have no model. So just to have one set of, of, of uh, rules that would work, that, that would be amazing progress. That would be tremendous progress. Uh, so I've written here, this, the problem today is not how to search the behavioral space, I don't think, rules parameters, but to find any rules that work, I mean, anything. So, uh, you know, once again, I, and yesterday I talked about the fact that so we have this book coming out with, with 100 data series in it. We can only explain about half of it. The other half, we just, we just have no idea why it's like that. But it, there are gross regularities at the level of 6 million firms, and we have no models to explain it. It's not like we're, and you remember the old days, the way it worked was you got a data set, you, you, you wrote a model, you explain the data. Now you, now you open the, you know, you open your, your email and you have a hundred data, data sets and you know, just no chance to explain most of it. Uh, there's a technical way to say this. I'm not going to get into details here to say that, but at least when it comes to economics, uh, uh, all the stuff on the left-hand side is what we teach. You know, all the stuff on the left-hand side are the features. These are all the features of our agent model. How do people learn? You know, what is the governance structure? Is there dynamics? You know, we teach all this stuff in the middle. And, uh, you know, we, you know, error to brew markets, and everybody's perfectly informed, and everything's pretty rational. Now, the, the, re the research literature is full of, hold all this stuff constant, and vary one of these things, right? Add network. Uh, make things finally rational, but then throw away the network. Almost nobody, no, no, one, no one knows how to turn all that on. Now, what, now it seems to me that one of the, one of the most, uh, you know, one of the most empowering features of ABM, daunting, but empowering, is that you can, in fact, turn all this on. You can, you can turn everything on at once. 
And so you're going to sail off to some world that we, you know, we have no idea what's there. Right? <laughs> you, uh, you, you've asked Queen Isabella for the, for the money to go to India, and uh, you got a boat that's going to take you, take you somewhere, and you land, <laughs> you land somewhere, and you, and you say, I, I, I've solved social science. You know, I, I, and they're all Indian. <laughs> and they're, they're Haitians, actually. They're not Indians at all. So I mean, it seems like the trouble, I mean, I, yes, we want to search the parameter space, and but of course, I mean, if, you, if you say you want to search all this stuff, then we don't even know how to, we don't know how to do the board problem here, so that's going to be the inverse problem. Uh, so, okay, so coming back now to the, you know, what we typically do, what we typically do is we're looking for the, for the, uh, you know, we're trying to make the model agree with the, with the aggregate data. So I'm going to just proceed here quickly, and hopefully we get back a little bit on the schedule, go to lunch. I want to think about, a, you know, an ABM is just a model. And it's really going to be, you know, for, our, for, our pur for purposes of what I'll talk about here, it's, it's a dynamical system. So we have some state of the world X, and we get some new state out of it. It depends on some parameters, okay? So it's just going to be at this level uh, a dynamical system. It's a, it's a, si it's a simulation in the, in the popular parlance. Uh, now, you know, already, you know, back when, uh, you know, when I was a graduate student 30 years ago now, I mean, uh, Herb Simon says, you know, every run of a simulation model is a theorem. I mean, it's if this and that. There's no, very few of us actually use real, radon sticks in our random number generator on a, on a USB port in our computer to get, to get true random numbers. Right? We just use pseudo. So every run is reproducible. It's, it's every run is a theorem. Uh, and then, you know, I, but back to what I said a couple slides ago, almost all the ABMs are multi-level in the sense, or micro macro. We're really trying to do the empirical stuff on the macro. So what I want to talk about now is I want to look, I'm going to look at, I'm going to just talk, about, talk conceptually about models that have multiple levels. And the main idea is going to be there's going to be different stuff happening at one level than the other level. Now, the word emergence is super loaded in this, in, this, in this whole area, and some people hate the word emergence, some people love it. Some people, you know, Bob Laughlin at Stanford says the whole, you know, all of, all of 20th century, 21st century physics will be about emergence. Now, I don't know if that's right, but, but the idea is that emergence uh, is a word we can certainly use to describe certain things. I'm going to use it today. If you don't like the word emergence, so don't worry, you can just re read the mathematics, okay? So, but, but, the, but, the, but, the, but I'm going to use, uh, use that because I think it's, it is useful to talk about it. Okay, so I want to think about, the, there's, a, there's a microscopic level here where we have imagined some very high dimensional system, and we're going to specify it. Now, we might not know really what all the rules are, but imagine we, we do have this specified. Maybe the parameters are unknown, but for now, imagine we, we have this thing. And let's talk about now a kind of a higher level thing. And I've, written, I've written here micro, meso, macro just, for, just to be uh, you know, complete about it, but, uh, but I'll, I'll, I'll give my example primarily micro to macro, but micro, meso, macro, there's some way to, to, mic, to map the microscopic states into the macroscopic ones. And I'll call, you know, A is kind of an aggregation operator here of some kind, okay? So it's just, this is just micro to macro. We imagine that the, y, the, the dimension of the Y uh, vector is much smaller than the, than the, than the lower level thing. Okay? So this is an Anasazi. You know, we have, we have, we have 10,000 agents. You know, we have about 1,000 agents running around on the Anasazi landscape. All we, the only output data we care about are going to be um, how many people are surviving at a certain time and where do they put their farms, okay? That was a very summary measure. Now, of course, you could do it, um, say, you could have a, this even, you know, micro, meso, macro. The stuff we do with firms really is agent worker level, firm level, uh, pop, you know, economy level. So that, that's, but uh, I, I'm going to skip that. I put it in here just, I said, just for completeness. Let's think, about, let's think about properties, though, of those dynamical systems, okay? And so uh, I've written here resultant properties. So, uh, you know, a, a usual contrast with the emergence is resultant. So just... So think about the following, is that if in fact I have microscopic equilibrium, so the whole thing shuts down, there's no, there are no more dynamics, well that must produce these meso and macro e equilibria. I mean, there's, just, there's, there's no way to avoid that, right? That, that's just imp implicit in the definition of what I just, what I just said. And stability, if, uh, if lambda sub i are the eigenvalues of the microscopic system, and they're all, you know, the, the whole thing is stable, there's no way I can get instability at a higher level. I mean, that's, that's just, that's, that results. The stability at the higher level results from the microscopic stability. And then sensitivity, think about it. how does the whole model depend on its parameters now? Well, in fact, if I can say, if I can, if I could say in fact, that a model was insensitive to parameter P sub i at the microscopic level, well, there's no way for it to be sensitive at the macroscopic level. I mean, it's just, it's, it, this, the parameter is not affecting anything microscopically, so it can't affect anything at the higher level. Just, there's no way for it to. And you can do the same thing with statistics. And there's a, there's a paper on this, so if anybody wants the details, I'll send the paper. I'm going to skip it now. It's more, it's more complicated. But now I want to talk about, I'm going to jump into now, uh, emergent properties. And it's going to go kind of in reverse here. It's going to say, imagine that we have an equilibrium <coughs> at the macroscopic level. Think about it merely as a, it's a steady state uh, I want to talk about, but, but it just means that the dynamics have vanished. 
at the macroscopic level, does that imply that I have lower level uh, equilibrium? And the answer is not, not in general, right? Because I can have a bunch of canceling out stuff. And we talked just, I mentioned yesterday, right? We have an average temperature in this room, average energy in the room, yet we have a lot of motion at the, at the, at the level of the, of the part of nitrogen and carbon dioxide and, uh, and oxygen that we're breathing, right? So, uh, so I, I'm going to give an example. I'm going to give an example of this in a minute, but I'm just asserting it now. And then the, since the same thing can be true for stability, you could say I could have emergent stability at the macroscopic level. Uh, that is, all the eigenvalues are less than zero, but, it, but, um, uh, but in fact, the microscopic level could be unstable. <coughs> and uh, I'll, I'll make it formal in a second, but the one I'm going to focus on today right now, because we're dealing with inverse problems and parameters, is this insensitivity one. I'm going to talk about if, in fact, I have a macroscopic system that's insensitive, it's not telling me anything about what's going on at the micro level. Right? I mean, it could be, in fact, that right as I, uh, you know, if I, if I uh, the, when the, kinetic, uh, when, when the gases in the, in the room bounce off each other in collisions, they're bouncing off at some particular angle. Uh, that angle, it turns out, is, is not relevant to what the temperature of the room is. Or it's, it's, not, it's not entering as a parameter in, in what the temperature of the room is. It may matter at microscopic level, but not the macroscopic level. And we can do some same with stuff. Let, let me give an example just to make it more concrete. Okay. So here's the simplest possible case. The world, whole world is linear, and there are two levels. There's this high-dimensional low level, low-dimensional uh, upper level. And then we're going to have this aggregation operator here. And now here it's just going to be a linear operator, right? It's just going to be a matrix, a giant matrix. And it turns out that for all this to go through, I just want to have it. It needs to be the case that, that the aggregate dynamics G are related to the aggregation operator uh, and the microscopic dynamics F uh, through GA equals AF. And then it turns out we can do a whole bunch of mathematics on GA equals AF, and there's a lot of, uh, you know, these are, this is a rectangular system now, right? I mean, the A is rectangular. You know, G is m-dimensional, small, uh, F is n-dimensional, high, and so we're using uh, inverse, uh, using a whole bunch of ideas about inverses and generalized inverses and pseudo-inverses and things you can talk about. What is, the, what, what is the relationship between G, A, and A, F? Now, what, as from a point of view of picking rules, though, one immediate thing is, if F is given, we can pick A and G. But you can't pick any A and G. You've got to pick A and G that are going to have certain properties, and it turns out, to our first approximation, the properties that they need to have here is that the the eigenvalues of F have to be buried somehow in the G and A somewhere. You, can, you can't have a completely different set of, uh, basically, G A minus A F equals zero. That, and this is Gottmacher 1957, and there's a whole bunch of theory about, that, about what, what's got to happen there. Okay. So first thing to say is that, notice, if, if, I'm in a, if I'm in a microscopic equilibrium, well, of course, if, you know, if, the, if the dynamics have vanished there, then of course that's, ma that's, an, that's a macroscopic equilibrium in this linear case, no question. And if, in fact, the parameters don't matter at the microscopic level, uh, that's the right, far right-hand side, then they also don't matter at the macroscopic level, okay, if some parameter is, ir is irrelevant. But it can be the case, right, that, uh, in fact, look at the, think about A, which is this rectangular matrix, right, which is uh, essentially like, you know, imagine I'm compressing a million dimensions down to 10 or something, right? I, I, have, I have a thousand Anasazi agents, and I only care about where they live and how many there are, to, down to two, okay? So A is, this, a is basically a, a, a compression or a, it's basically a projection from a high dimensional space to a low dimensional one. And so it has a very large null space. So N of A is the null space. It is where all the where vectors that go into that get, you know, basically vanish. So all the X of I that are in the null space of A are going to give me pseudo equilibria. Y. So all the, all the X stars that are in the null space of A are going to basically produce Y stars that are, that are going to be arrogant emergent steady states. And the basic theorem, if you look up the linear algebra book, is the, the more rectangular uh, the, the A is, the more you're going to expect this kind of thing to happen, r roughly. And of course, the, always the parameter is going to matter, the number is going to matter. But, but the idea is that if you're, if you're shrinking from, from 900 dimensions down to 899, well, the, the null space might be small. But if you're going from, uh, from 900 dimensions down to 2, then you expect the, the null space to be huge. And you get a whole bunch of these kind of pseudo-equilibria or quasi-equilibria. We can call it what I'm going to call them, I'm calling them here emergent equilibria, okay? You may not like, not, not like the terminology. We've variously called them spurious or something. But it's obviously from the interaction of the individuals, there arises, uh, there, there are individual dynamics in, in X star, and those vanish with Y star. And so the micro and macro level have different properties. Everybody okay with that? And then this, the sensitivity one is the one I want to focus on, just from the point of view of, of estimation. So now, once again, if I say if this X, X star star plate, you know, this thing does not depend on the parameter, or, you know, sorry, it's in the null space. So imagine that, X, this, that, that term is not zero, dx 
star star DPI is not zero, but it's in the null space of of, of A, or well, then uh, I'm going to get then that that thing's going to vanish again, right? So even though the microscopic system depends on on you know the the, the particles in the, in the room depend on the, the, the dynamics depend on what is the angle of of, of collision when, when they when they when they hit each other, is not altering the temperature of the room. Right now, this is a, this is once again this is a little bit abstract. So I'm going to give a very, even a more concrete example. Okay, so the more concrete example is it's going to be, a, but it's going to be kind of a trivial example. It's going to be from two dimensions do, down to one. Okay, so this, now this is an example of Psi Levin uh, that I, I've just reinterpreted. Okay, X. This is an ecology. X. The X sub one refers to how many individuals are present. X sub two refers to what is their average body mass. And it's just some kind of it's a kind of a, you know it's a grazing on a, on a landscape with a finite amount of resources, okay? It, but it's a dynamical system here, and it's gonna basically it's going to be how do the individuals exploit the landscape? You're going to produce more individuals. They're going to have bigger body mass, et cetera. Well, it does have a aggregate uh, representation uh, uh, as just the total biomass of the system, individuals times the average weight, okay? So here's the, here are the dynamics of the aggregate system. Usually it's hard to get this thing. This is just because it's such a toy example, we can get it exactly. And it has this equilibrium here, and I'm not going to go into the details, but if you ask me for the paper, I'll, the paper has all the details. Underlying this thing is a lot of, the X will stay dynamical. The X will stay, except for some trivial equilibria, the X will stay moving around, going up and down right, various ways, but the but Y will become a, will reach a steady state. Okay, so this is an example of an emerging equilibria. What I want to get to is, though, in terms of estimating an equilibrium, say, look, at that equilibrium depends on several different parameters there, right? If we had uh, data about different kinds of equilibrium, we could maybe estimate the parameters or, or, or figure out what the equilibrium wants. A, a, a slightly different example is the following. We don't want to get into this insensitivity idea. <coughs> it is that here's a different ecology, and don't ask me what it stands for. This is also a side of an example, which, which you gave me, but it's another, another ecology. Uh, here are the equilibria of this uh, system when you specify the B function to be linear. Okay, that's, that's part, of the, part of the deal. Now it turns out here's the aggregate. Here are the aggregate dynamics for this. Here, here's the kind of the, here's the you know the high level dynamics for this for this model. So it's a microscopic system, macroscopic system. Here's the macroscopic uh, equilibrium. And uh, if you so eyeball it, you're going to see what I'm going to what I'm going to say next. So I'm going to not say it yet and show you the formal result. Here is how or here is how the the microscopic system depends on parameter parameter b zero. And you see it depends in some non-trivial way on parameter b zero. Here is how I would generally compute, in the lower left-hand corner now, here's how I would generally compute the parameter dependence of the equilibrium uh, I have to go through the aggregation functions, et cetera, et cetera, compute it from a gradient kind of thing. But basically, if you end up, I would get then that, look, the, that equilibrium depends on, on M and C and R, but if you compute, how does it depend on B? It doesn't. It vanishes, right? So it's, it's a toy example, but the basic idea is that, so if you now wanted to say, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to figure out what that, now, I've got an age-based model which has parameters, you know, have parameters uh, M, C, R, and B0. And now I'm going to use my aggregate data to figure out what those parameters are. Well, you can get three of them, but you can't get the other one. It's not, not possible. Right. So, it's a, this is, so, I, so this is an example where we have this emergent sensitivity, and now it's putting an important constraint on what we can figure out vis-a-vis uh, -vis the microscopic rules. I mean, it's, 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 it's just a limitation. Okay, not, I don't want to say much more than that. Uh, so the summary is that... Uh, you know, almost all of our ABMs are calibrated using this from an aggregate perspective. Uh, the emergent properties, you know, once again, I'm using the word emergent here just to say the properties are different at the microscopic and macroscopic, micro and macro levels. Uh, and then we're going to just have to be careful that we, uh, when we're measuring, in essence, these deep, deeper parameters, that the deep, deeper parameters may have a different form in, this, in the aggregate uh, representation. Okay. I'll stop there uh, and take some questions to Aaron. Yes, Jim. Uh, could you yeah. tie this to the infamous, yeah. infamous concept of uh, downward causality? <laughs> yeah, right. Um, I wonder if the, these, these are good examples to use or not. Um, unfortunately, they, you know, the examples that are easily mathematically tractable may, may not be the best ones to be illustrative of the idea. But uh, uh, maybe so. Let's, let's do the. Uh, let's try the try the equilibrium case first. Turns out. In the paper, which I'll, I'll send everybody who wants, I'll send you, Jim, but uh, when we actually say, why does it emerge, I kind of go through the details and say, well, actually, here's a bunch of stuff that cancels out. And here's why it, how, it just kind of happens, happens 
that it, that it does that. I'm, I'm going to go back to, to the linear case here, and this may be the better one to talk through. We just that's a uh, <coughs> so downward causality would, would be something along the lines of the fact that once the higher level thing has emerged, so once we have macroscopic uh, once we have macroscopic, macroscopic steady state has emerged that is not a microscopic one, that, that, that's the emergent property. Then it's going to be the case that the particles, in essence, are excuse me, what we think about it. So all the particles are, by this definition, the fact that we're in equilibrium in, in the room, uh, yet we have underlying molecular motion, is going to, uh, that is an example of this phenomenon. So we say the fact that the whole thing has equilibrated means that, uh, means that the particles are going to only face a certain kind of fluctuation, a certain kind of set of collisions. Uh, versus where, if it, imagine that somebody cranked the heat up now, and all of a sudden there's a bunch of new energy coming into the room. Now you're going to basically have a, a different distribution. Uh, and so uh, the, what the individual particles have, of, you know, what they can feel is going to be quite different if you're in equilibrium or not. Um, but, the, but the causation, I guess, is because it, it maybe you know, you and I spoke briefly yesterday. In the case of it, maybe you can talk about it in the case of more of a compartmentalized system, like, like a cell or something. Uh, but you know, maybe in the case of the room, we just have the... Uh, uh, I, mean, I guess you know, the opportunities for for molecular motion are going to be different whether you're in equilibrium or not. Can you just say simply that you eliminated the N A state? Oh, so fair enough. That's going to be a good way to say. Actually, yeah. I, I, yeah. you suddenly jumped into yeah. my mind. That's right. Uh, that might actually be the mechanism. Right. There's a whole bunch of whole bunch of ways to describe the mechanism. Very simple. Right. So bunch we'll, of potential states uh, without the upper level. Uh, emergent behavior, but those then disappear under the emergent. They disappear. That's right. So that's interesting. That's well, the only thing about this is that right, all, all that matrix is doing, right? Matrix just, just you know, you've got some vector vector here, and I'm just trans. The matrix just transforms into, into some, something else. It's into a different vector. Right? I'm just transforming one vector into a different vector. And now when I have this particular one, I have this uh, very high degree of compression, like you know, 10 to the 23rd Avogadro's number of, of atoms versus one uh, temperature value. I've got this huge compression, right? I've created a giant number. Of, uh, of, of these null states, yes. and so I, 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 you, you lose a bunch of them. Essentially, uh, when, when I look at emergence, I always look at pruning rules. And this is a very yeah. simple pruning rule. Uh, exactly. uh, that the null states are essentially the pruning rule between the higher level emergence and the lower level ensemble. I think it's, I think it's very well. And there's a, you said there's a question on the line? Yep. Founders? Ah, okay, sorry. Um, yes, hi. Uh, hi, Rob. Um, so you, you basically said in the beginning that uh, you're trying to get from level two to level three, right? From the macro estimation to the micro yeah. estimation. And actually this example, this classification I used also in my classes and it kind of appears very appealing. But so if you look at the literature currently, like the last five years or so, uh, like all the macro ABMs, even the ones from PISA, you know, uh, yeah. I mean, kind of the leading people in the field we are hard to get from level one to level two. So everybody's still matching stylized facts basically at the macro level. And we're really struggling to get this empirical validation in quantitative sense for even a, a couple of macro variables. So I don't know, how, how do you see this then? I mean, so for me, from my perspective, it's hard to get to level two even. Well, fair enough, yes. It's hard to do a good job on level two, right? I think that the state of the art is, in fact, just to do it's just a live in level two. And uh, it took that um, uh, at, at that live meeting I mentioned, Sander, uh, I, I, I took I took the occasion to dig out all the empirical ABMs I could find that were, were trying to do trying to be rip rigorous, most of which are in finance, like unsurprising. And as you just said, Sander, almost all of them are in the in the past five years. So there's been a big push to get stuff into level two in the last five years, and it's like finance is the main area just because there's such good data. Uh, but um, well, now uh, there are there are you know there are increasingly now there are going to be swaths of uh, chunks of data in specific domains where once again like Meg Becker for now those housing market models I mean we really have data you know Fairfax County on every house every household every every mortgage so if you really think about matching the microscopic level in principle uh, we we don't know how to do that well but I think it's, you know, it's, that that that's on the horizon so, a little. As someone mentioned earlier, things are going slowly. It seems like this. So maybe we will take 50 years to do that. Sir. Uh, can there be multiple meso levels? And if so, does that uh, provide a structure of sort of the the 
the to calculating the emergence going up from the micro to macro? Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course. In, in reality, it is not. They're not just three levels. There's many levels, right? So, I don't, yeah. So that's the. Uh, I mean, I think that's. the uh, In reality, it'd be something like you know, there's uh, there are regulatory levels, you know, there's, and then there's national levels and international levels. In reality, yeah. who knows how many levels there are? It's, yeah. Of course, the levels are even not even always uh, smoothly separated. So, uh, yeah. I think that's uh, but but I, whether that gives us a power to do better or whether it makes us a job harder, I don't know. Okay. Okay. Not, not, not obvious to me. Like, uh, quick comment on level three in finance. You know, that's that's always going to be challenging, actually, because you know a lot of micro data in finance is uh, is always going to be proprietary and difficult to get. But uh, the other bigger what? Well, what if God handed it to you? Oh yeah, yeah. Well, that's, okay, but, but then, I had a better yeah better relationship with God. I, if, if, if you had transactional uh, data, on God equals Google, right? Yeah. Can you, yeah, you need to, transactional data and the names on it is always. Uh -huh. um, I want to get back to your emergence example. Uh, you know, I think what we're often interested in is something quite different, I think. It's really, I'm thinking about at the individual level, there's some, I'm always thinking about stochastic models. There's some sort of noise. It would be canceling central limit theorems holding. I always think the interesting thing about complex systems is these are places where something interesting about the structure of the model is killing the, the CLT. Uh -huh. and, and I'm getting emergent dynamics yeah. from the, something interesting about the model at the macro level. I mean, not, it's not canceling out. Uh -huh. And why isn't it can't? That's sort of always, you know, we use the ideal gas as sort of the non-complex. Exactly right. Yeah. <laughs> um, I agree. I think that, you know, because the classic example, we talked about this in this paper, uh, that uh, uh, the classic example is the central limit theorem is a strong candidate for being an amazing emergent structure. Yes, yeah, it is a, uh, but a boring one. But yeah. A little bit boring. But it's uh, powerful. Powerful. So, uh, anyway, so I, I think, yeah, I think there's, there's much more to be said about that. And, and of course, then there's whole bit about novelty. And I mean, that's, that's about everything. You know, yeah. I'll take a few days of that now. So one, one point and one question. You, you've basically got an issue of identifiability with one of the parameters in this ecological model. And I just wanted to point out that there's, for decades now, people keep publishing papers about universality and, and stuff. And I just want to point out that for every universal behavior, there's an identifiability issue because you can't get at the parameters that are involved in it. The, the other thing. I just wanted to ask was, have you thought at all about things like the, the arrow of time issue that I brought up? That here's a, here's a, a, a property that's respected at the microscopic level and never shows up at the macroscopic level. That's a very deep question, Stephen. I, I, I wish I had time to think about that. I don't know. But, uh, but, uh, but that's your point about this. Yeah, I think that this identifiability issue, I should have said, I mean, this, this is something which is well studied in. Uh, because only kind of metrics, and this would be the ecological inference problem, right? If I have only average data, what can I say about the microscopic world? I mean, this is a wide push on that. This is not new. I, I'm, not, I'm just trying to say that it's something which we need to be aware of, careful about. And when I'm out of equilibrium, does it mean that it's easier for me to deduce the micro state? It could be. It might be. Yeah. Maybe. Because things have not canceled out. And, uh, they might. I'm not sure. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if there's a, a general result about that. I, I mean, I just, even in the linear case, would there be a general result? Uh, not, I'm not sure. But some may be canceled, and maybe some would not be canceled. Can you take out all the assumptions here? Yeah, right. Exactly. I mean, I guess if I can see, right, if this stuff, this stuff only vanishes in equilibrium, and it's not, yeah. not vanish on, on, on the trajectory down somewhere, I, I can learn something about it, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So, Rob, I just want to make a small uh, comment. Uh, we are doing forecasting for epidemic dynamics, and we have a similar issue that has come up where at least CDC used to publish just national level dynamics and they've started publishing now state level dynamics and we have actually started forecasting in our group uh, county level dynamics as well for which the data is currently not available but it has got the same sense of uh, spatial hierarchies that are built in and it turns out that the, the class of models that you use to do this sometimes produces interesting results. So people are at least empirically observing in, in the, the competitions that sometimes if you do a better job uh, at the, say, state level, then you're able to do better job at the national level. 
uh, in the ensembling. And, uh, you know, we don't understand it well, and it might just be an artifact of the models. But I just want to point out that this yeah. is starting to play out where data is coming in. We actually think that we can go down to even even more finer levels in the case of influenza, and uh, and if uh, we can work with certain, you know, groups of you know you know firms that have data, we might even be able to go down at a very very detailed microscopic level in that yeah. particular case. Uh, maybe this brings up a, a, a somewhat different issue too, is that uh, I mean, it's check when we when we maybe just writing, writing prototype models when we're just kind of. Uh, Starting out with a new ABM, some kind, we'll say, I'm going to use 100 agents, I'm going to use 1,000 agents. Well, why? Well, why that many? And then, so the, the scale of the model, the scale of the model probably has effects on, you know, how big that melt space is, right? And, and if you, as you keep going down, you know, the larger or smaller, you're going to make you modify that, so you're going to get presumably different, essentially, different qualitative dynamics of your model based on, and then, and then maybe, then maybe then whether, whether the microscopic one can be accurate enough, or the, or the, or, or the average one is, is Washed out all the care that you care about. That may be more of a central limit here, a lot of large numbers thing. So, things we should, we should care about. The next thing is in theory, you can open a book and say, like, you know, I want to build a model of, you know, a contact process, I'll have, I'll have infectious disease. You need to have at least n equals 10,000, otherwise, the, the stats are going to be, this is going to be awful and no way to do it. You have to have some kind of rule of thumb to stick on. So, as you, as you have things like, you know, in the bench experiment, I'll have to do 35 trials to, you know, to, to, to get myself out of it, to get myself toward, somewhere toward the, you know, the, be able to use actual statistics on it. We don't have that in ABM. We need to have some. We need to have a research program. It seems to me on the foundation of ABM to resolve these. That's actually a great transition. Yep. Um, 